In 1983, there were 900,000 small factories in Japan. Today, there are only half that. Local governments in areas where these factories are concentrated have started to offer a helping hand. Auto Ward in Tokyo has built factory apartment buildings offering cheap rent. This building is equipped with large lifts to move heavy equipment and communal conference rooms that can be used for business meetings. It not only provides the base of operations for small factories, it also helps them collaborate so that they can make new products themselves, independent of large corporations. These days, small factories are doing everything they can to keep going. I've come across town to Sumida Ward, another part of Tokyo that has many small factories. And the local authorities here are working with a number of them on collaborative projects. This is one of those factories and they make umbrellas in here. Let's go in and take a look. And this is the president of the company, Mr. Yasushi Hanada. Thank you very much for taking time to see us today. I thought that I'd wandered into a greengrocer's shop for a moment and these beautiful green umbrellas. There's this project in Sumida Ward called Monozukuri Collaboration. And making these umbrellas is a collaborative effort by the local government, a small factory, that's us, and a designer. See, it all began with this product proposal that we received. Oh, this is really pretty. It's nicely put together, isn't it? The moment I saw it, I thought, oh, I just have to make this. And uh, so we did. That's really interesting because you have this rounded edge here. It looks like the lettuce leaf. And you have it, um, the gradation. We tried so many different colors to make it look as close to lettuce as possible and came up with this. And I can see um, they're working on these things. There's a lot of hand sewing going on. It's obviously pretty labor intensive as well. There are hardly any workshops in Japan still doing this kind of work. There are so few artisans now, and it's hardly profitable. You know, I'm just so grateful for all their hard work. Thank you very much. In the past, most of the work that small factories did was subcontracted, but recently, as we just heard from Mr. Hanada, some of the factories are starting to create their own original products. Now let's meet a man who's using his factory's unique manufacturing capabilities to create something that's really pushing the envelope. Sumida Ward in Tokyo is home to a dense cluster of around 4,000 small factories. Among them, there is this very small factory with just six employees. The head of the factory is Masayuki Okano. He's an industry veteran with more than 60 years experience in metalworking. In 2003, he developed a product that had been considered impossible. A hypodermic needle with a tip just 0.2 millimeters across. This is so slender, it can penetrate skin without causing pain, like a mosquito bite. It's thrilling to do something that nobody else can, because, well, nobody else can. Like climbing a mountain that no one else has climbed. That's the ultimate for a mountain climber. Simply being slender is not enough. The needles have to be slender at the tip, but wider at the base. Otherwise, the drug will not flow smoothly through the needle. Fabricating this shape is very challenging. Conventional hypodermics are made by drawing out metal piping long and thin. This means the tip and the base are the same width. Okano decided to use a metal press instead, which can form any shape. The technique itself is nothing new, but using it to achieve this degree of precision posed a new challenge. The material is a sheet of stainless steel five hundredths of a millimeter thick. It must be pressed to form individual rounded needles with hollow centers. The tricky part is that any gap in the seam, where the two ends of the rounded sheet meet, will cause leaking. And welding the seam is not an option, because the heat would warp the needle. Okano used a technique called deep drawing, 
in which the press is applied multiple times to bend and stretch the metal. It required trial and error to determine the structure and shape of the mould, the amount of pressure and the right lubricant. It is very important to keep refining old techniques. So important. If you think about the theatre, for instance, you need to know the classics before you write a new piece. That's true of our trade as well. Without mastery of the low-tech, you can't have the high-tech. After two years using all his accumulated know-how to the fullest, Okano finally created his groundbreaking ultra-thin hypodermic needle. The seam is completely invisible and no liquid leaks out. Okano didn't stop there. He went on to perfect a needle two hundredths of a millimetre narrower than the previous one. It's just 0.18 millimetres across. Okano's factory makes precision parts that no one else can make and it constantly receives requests from around the world, including from NASA. Here are a couple of those painless hypodermic needles. This one in the middle here is just 0.2 millimetres wide and the one next to it even smaller, 0.18 millimetres. And we've got a regular hypodermic here just for the sake of comparison. This big building behind me here is one of Tokyo's major convention centers, and they've got a convention on right now of and for small factories. Let's take a look. And this is the Hokusai 3, a fully electric vehicle. You just plug it into the mains at home for eight hours, and it runs for 35 kilometers. Eleven small factories from Sumida Ward came together to put this thing on the road. One doing the body, one doing the interior, one doing the dashboard, etc, etc. And this is just part of a wave of new manufacturing initiatives, bringing together small factories, each with their own different specialities. In 2009, many small factories in Higashi, Osaka, worked together to launch a small satellite called Mido One. In the midst of a tough recession, it was built to be a beacon of hope. In the spirit of Mido One, four small factories in the Katsushika ward of Tokyo decided to tackle another ambitious project. Their goal was not out of space, but the bottom of the ocean. This is the deep sea survey device called Edoko One. Full scale development began in 2012. The objective is to make it capable of going 8,000 meters deep. The man who put out the call to create the Edoko One is Yukio Sugino, the president of a rubber products manufacturer with just four employees. They launched a satellite, which seemed an impossible dream. It showed us the fantastic things that small factories can do. We have technical capabilities that are just as good as those companies. So, why couldn't we do something great for the world? Why not go to the deep sea? Just seemed like an interesting idea, really. Sugino had developed rubber products for a number of industries, but the deep sea was a new frontier for him. He discussed the concept with various experts and came up with this. This glass sphere is able to withstand the pressure at a depth of 8,000 meters. And each one costs around 300,000 yen to make, a relatively small sum. With their limited development budget, it was ideal. Sugino spent a year developing a survey device that used these glass spheres. The Edoko One is made up of several of them, and they're designed to hold camera, lighting, and communications equipment. The spheres are housed in plastic covers. The legs have tubes attached that can suck up samples. The idea is to carry the Adoko One out to sea on a small boat, attach a sinker and let the vessel fall into the sea. When it touches down on the sea floor, its video camera automatically starts recording and mud and microbes are sucked up. After its survey is completed, the sinker is released and the Edoko One floats back to the surface. 
Sugino believes that to achieve this plan, total development costs will be about 20 million yen. Sugino attracted the interest of three other small factories, all small to medium-sized enterprises with 20 to 30 employees. Each possessed advanced technological know-how in its own field. This is Toshinori Sakurai, who heads an electronics maker that is handling the power system for the Edoka One. After positioning the cameras and lights, they're completely sealed in the glass spheres. Sakurai came up with a method of using a coil to transmit electricity through the glass. Through a process of experimentation, he's searching for the most efficient way to make current flow by adjusting the winding and thickness of the coil. It's a long way down to the spheres, and we want to transmit as much electricity as possible while making the charging device itself as small as possible. That is the most difficult part. If we can make it work well, it will be a big breakthrough. Sugino is in charge of a device to relay data underwater. Because the main equipment is housed in separate glass spheres, in order for them to operate in sync, signals must be sent between them wirelessly. But these radio signals are blocked by seawater. So Sugino worked with a university research team to come up with a solution. And he discovered that connecting the glass spheres with a certain type of material would enable radio signals to travel between them underwater. In October 2012, a prototype of the Edoko-1 was completed and tested off Enoshima, an island in Kamagawa. The plan was for it to descend to 55 meters and fill the seafloor, then float back up. It succeeded in taking footage, but the release of the sinker didn't work, and the Edoko-1 had to be hauled up by its emergency line. Today we had a failure, and that's very disappointing. We will analyze it exhaustively to find out what went wrong. We want to send the Edoko-1 down into the Japan Trench at 8,000 to 9,000 meters next summer. The Edoko-1 project is a fusion of technologies from several small factories. Their challenge continues. There's an often told adage about areas like this where you find large numbers of small factories. They say that if you take your blueprint, fold it into a paper aeroplane, give it a throw, come back in three days, you'll have your product to pick up and take away with you. It's an indication of just how many small factories there used to be and the extent of their technological prowess. In places like Britain, where I grew up, I think if you had small enterprises like this, they'd very quickly get bought out by large corporations. Unfortunately, small companies in Japan are now finding it increasingly more difficult to survive in the current economy here. And that's a great shame, because with the flexibility that these small factories have on account of their size, plus their technological know-how, they've been an indispensable force in Japanese industry for a long time. I'll see you again next time. Next time on our talk series, Japanophiles, we meet the American architect Asby Brown, who is showing the world how